for Miss Lana and this praise team. Look at that choir today. God bless you, ladies and gentlemen. Desert Hills, I'll tell you what, you're so blessed you don't even know it. Amen or oh me. Amen. Amen. Well, listen up. As usual, I have some pre-message business to take care of. It's good business. Good business. Uh, whose business is it? I think it's the Lord's business. Who is the Lord's business? You are the Lord's business. Today, what I'd like to do is, uh, again, give a a brief update on our uh, roof and uh, what we have experienced uh, the last two weeks. Uh, if you're here today as our guest, uh, two weeks ago, uh, the wind saw fit to take off about a quarter of our roof of our fellowship hall. And uh, in between times, Brother um, Ray Martinez and uh, Larry, Larry Miles, came up and they, uh, they stapled and weighed down about 200 to 300 feet of this queen up there, uh, a plastic covering, not unlike a tarp, if you will. Uh, and yet, and yet, the water still got in. Um, uh, three o'clock, three o'clock Sunday, uh, Saturday morning, uh, I heard tell that Larry had just gotten up uh, and realized it was raining, and he hightailed it down here. And thank God for Larry, because uh, when he got here, he got to the gate, and of course it set off the sensor, which woke up Bill. And then Bill couldn't sleep after he saw that Larry was down here, so he hightailed it down here. And then, um, through some uh, electronic communication, um, soon to follow was Ken and Yoli, who headed down here. And then, bless their hearts, they called me at 9 a.m. I was grateful for that. Of course, I was just falling asleep at 3 a.m. But I came down, and uh, Geo had already come down here as well. What I'm about to do, folks, uh, not just mention their names, but rather show gratitude other than lip service to the people who respond to the call and respond to the needs of the church, even though they need not be asked by me. There are no words and there are no amounts that could ever express my personal gratitude for what God does through all of those individuals that serve here at Desert Hills. But at the risk of uh, making them mad at me, I'd like to call Ken and Yoli Henson forward. Ken, you can represent Yoli if she's, you know, Ken and Yoli, would you please come forward and accept this token of our esteem and love for you? Can we praise God for these two? Well, while they're making their way up here, I think Gio is probably taking off his robe as he is in the choir, but Gio, he came up. Thank you. And, and Yoli, as I said a second ago, thank you for marrying Ken. Um, most of you men, I thank your wives for marrying you. Ken would be lost without Yoli. Um, Giovanni came up and he saw fit to, um, to go and borrow extra floor fans that I will say, as of this morning, 
the carpets are 100% dry. Where there were puddles Saturday leading up into Saturday afternoon, it is now dry. Liz, will you come and accept this gift on behalf of your wonderful husband? Amen. Praise God. And, and remind him, remind him to thank you for marrying you. I appreciate that. Now, uh, these next three men that I'm going to mention, there's no one in greater or less importance at Desert Hills. We all serve in different capacities uh, according to our abilities and uh, availability. Uh, but this next gentleman I uh, have found to not just become one of my close, fast friends and brothers in Christ, but God has gifted him in many, many ways that, that, to help and, and minister to you all. To help and minister to you all. And that's Brother Ray Martinez. If you'll please come forward, Brother Ray. Thank your mom for having you. Okay, thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Appreciate that. Now I'm going to ask uh, one of our ushers, possibly Dean, uh, to come forward for this next gentleman because he's busy making sure the lights and the sound are okay. And uh, he will definitely be mad at me if I make him walk that walk. But uh, easy, easy, Dean, easy, just one second. <laughs> um, another fast friend and brother in Christ uh, is this next gentleman, Bill Hughes. Uh, last night we were having a talk in the office. We called it Manistry. Uh, we were having a men's gathering, if you will. And uh, one of the things I'm so grateful for are not just ministers who, who serve, but ministers that take responsibility. Ministers that take responsibility. Uh, I am not prone to lead by consensus, and I have been, I have been, um, I have been resistant to individual um, suggestions, especially those who refuse to take responsibility but demand influence. Um, while Bill has taken responsibility, he has never demanded influence. Hence, I am much more, um, much more akin to listen to Bill. When Bill says, we need this, we get that. And Bill spent all day yesterday helping us all try to dry that portion of our of our worship center when he was supposed to be fixing that light. That light, which unbeknownst to all of us, has been sparking and arcing this entire time. Think now about all of the people in our lives here at Desert Hills Baptist Church that take responsibility, that take responsibility and move forward in the love they have for Christ, and my friends, the love they have for you. So I'm going to ask Dean if you'll please uh, uh, deliver that to Bill Hughes in the sound booth. I appreciate that. Now this last gentleman, sitting on the back row, and he's done his good Catholic duty and wore green today. And as I came in, I, I reiterated the words that I've already spoken, that there are no words and there is no amount that we could give to show, and I could give to show, my overwhelming love and appreciation for the things that people do around here. Uh, this time I'd like to call Larry Miles forward. Easy, easy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Come on up here. Let me go <laughs> under you. So, uh, Larry's just got a servant's heart. You gave me one. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. So, okay. here's the thing. We love you, you rascal. I love you. I know. Because <laughs> I know because you know what? It takes love to get people up out of 3, 3 a.m. in the morning. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, sir. Now, you know, um, that is always done, that is always done 
in recognition, or not always done in recognition, but when it is done, it is done in recognition for what God is doing through people. So although we express our appreciation to people, we give God the glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I thank you for allowing me the, uh, a time to do that. Uh, again, uh, I echo my, my son's prayer. Uh, we do have issues uh, with our roof. It's a, it's a 60-year-old building down that hallway. Um, we have been blessed for many, many years to have other men and women who have saw fit to take care of and steward over the facilities God has given us. Um, but I will say this. I have a hard time feeling sorry for us, <laughs> our church, and myself when I know for a fact that billion-dollar hotels down on the Strip are leaking like a sieve every time it rains. So in that, can we continue to just praise God and move forward without fear or overwhelming concern? God's going to take care of us. He always has, and I believe he always will. Amen or oh me. Amen. bow with me as we seek the Lord's face today. Father in heaven, greatest God Almighty, I thank you again for all who are in attendance and especially those who have been singled out. Indeed, Lord, would I have the coffers, the coffers of the treasury, there would be not enough to bestow upon the many, many individuals here at Desert Hills who serve openly and quietly. We thank you, God, for those you have given us here at Desert Hills. Father God, I, I pray for the lost soul today. I pray that the lost will come to the understanding of just that. They need you, Lord. They are lost without Christ. I pray that those who have received Christ will be baptized through believer's baptism no longer relying on what their parents did for them while they were in diapers, but instead stand up and be counted as one of the faithful, showing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has made all things possible for us. Father God, I pray that you continue to grow Desert Hills Baptist Church. One, Ken and Yoli, Giovanni, Ray Martinez, Bill Hughes, and Larry and Francis, miles at a time. We're so grateful. I'm so grateful, Lord. It always occurs to me uh, my own inadequacies when I see such a great caliber of believer who stands shoulder to shoulder with me in this great work, seeking your kingdom and your righteousness together. We love you, Father. We pray for our nation, even as I echo again my son's prayer. Help this nation. Help our nation and protect your people, especially in the year 2024. I pray for the pastors, the preachers, the teachers, the ministers. I pray that they will return to the truth of your word. That they will stand on your word and proclaim your word without apology. And in doing so, Lord, Lean, as my son said, heavily, heavily upon your helps, your guidance, and your protection. Without you, we can do nothing. In Jesus' precious name, all of God's people said, amen, amen and amen. We are continuing in our study of 1 John, or the preaching series of 1 John. And I gave only one verse of chapter 4 as our springboard verse because I'm going to uh, try to make some correlation and application with the 21st century believer, the 21st century church as it is used commonly in general, and the 21st century unbeliever. Here in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, John is very keen very keen to warn the saints. He is warning them of heresies and false prophets, even false teachers. It's all encompassed 
in the concept of a false prophet, those who would come and beguile, beguile the Christian and beguile the churches and beguile even you if you should allow it. Uh, in context of the verse, historically, uh, uh, what we see is John, John bowing up against the Gnostic teachings that were prevalent in the first century. You don't need to know what a Gnostic is, except in this, they believed they knew something greater and deeper, more mystical and spiritual than Jesus Christ crucified. Jesus Christ buried, and Jesus Christ risen again on the third day. This is the gospel. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ having died for the sins of the world, as the Bible attests to plainly, uh, Jesus Christ being buried three days in a tomb, as the Bible prophesied would happen, and him even rising again of his own volition as God in the flesh. He was God in the flesh in his three-year ministry as the sinless one. He was every bit God in the flesh as he hung on the cross for the sins of the world. And momentarily, momentarily, the eternal spiritual unity that the Son had with God the Father had a break in it. As God poured out his wrath upon his only begotten Son, that we being sinners might become children of God. Even so, he rose again on the third day as the scriptures said he would. If you're here today and you have no faith in what I have just said, you are lost. If any of that, any of that is minus your theology, if any of that is minus your belief and faith in the risen Christ, you need to go back to the Bible. Indeed, these Gnostics would present themselves as having deep-seated, esoteric, hidden knowledge. Deep-seated, esoteric, meaning uh, coveted, yet hidden knowledge. Christ did not remain hidden in the grave. He rose from the grave, and he came unto those who had placed their faith and trust in him before, even though they may not and most likely did not understand that he was God in the flesh. For this I point back to the selfsame penman, John, and his gospel, chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ was and is God in the flesh, my friends. It is a confession, not a creed. It is a confession that you can find in your Bible. There may be creeds that agree with it, but the key is, is to believe and trust what God has written. Amen or oh me. We see here that John writes, Beloved, believe not every spirit. Believe not every spirit. Uh, we are not to believe every whim of doctrine, nor every teacher or prophet or preacher that comes down the road, that occupies our attention on the television, on the radio, or TikTok, YouTube, or Instagram. Rather, rather, we are to be weary of this simple fact that not every spirit is a godly and a holy spirit. Mankind, mankind started off as a living spirit. The Bible attests to God having formed Adam out of the earth, out of the clay of the ground, and he breathed into him, and man and Adam became a living spirit. However, after the fall, after the fall, there was not only physical death that entered the world, but spiritual death. After the fall, all of mankind afterwards would be born into this world being separated from God, spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. And no matter how much 
philosophy, no matter how much mythalizing there is, no matter how beautiful the concept or the words, know this, without Jesus, you will remain dead in your sins. It is only Jesus Christ that has the power, the will, and the determination to have become the sacrifice for your sins that you might have forgiveness of those sins. That's the gospel in a quick nutshell. But even in the first church, our enemy and those who would be used by our enemy began to attempt to erode the truth of the gospel. Not every spirit, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. That word try is test. Test the spirits. People get very offended when I interview them or not all people, but some people get very offended when I begin to interview them uh, for a baptismal candidate, um, never thinking that I might possibly be offended by the fact that there is no confession of conversion. Rather, it comes back to me like this. When did you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Well, I've always known him. You've always known him? Well, we're going to get to some verses today that beg to differ. And they are in, contra on, in contrast to God's Word. Not me. They're in contrast to God's Word. Well, I've always known. I was raised a Christian. No, you may have been raised in a Christian home. But until you've made that confession yourself, you've admitted that you're a sinner, you've believed upon the risen Christ and confessed Him as your Lord and Savior, my friends, at best, you may just be a nice person. But know this. There are none good, no not one. And again, take it up with your Bible. Don't be mad at me. Take it up with the Bible. We stand on the Bible here at Desert Hills Baptist Church. Amen? Even so, I have some things I'd like to read, from, read to you from my favorite humanist. They say, oh boy, here we go. He's adulterating the Word of God. No. Rather, what I would do is I would point to this very pragmatic truth that even a broken clock can be right twice a day. What I have in my hands is something that came very easy, easily for me last night as I was doing my final study and putting my thoughts together for today's message prayerfully. And uh, it came very easily to me today. When four years ago I was looking for this essay I must, you, you all have Googled stuff here. I know, everybody here has probably been on the internet. I, I, I couldn't find hide nor hair of this very simple essay written by, again, my favorite humanist, Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell was born in 1872. Bertrand Russell died in 1970 as he was closing in on the 100-year mark. Bertrand Russell is famous for writing a, an, essay said, why, uh, an essay titled, Why I Am Not a Christian. I'm not telling you to go look at that. Rather, I would propose today that Bertrand Russell, having once been exposed to the truth, could be right even twice a day, even as a broken clock is. The essay I have in my hand um, is called The Superior Virtue of the Oppressed. And again, to refer back to my uh, beginning uh, statement in this, last night I thought, i got to look this up again because I'd like to have it in hand and, and really dig into it to make sure I'm not just remembering points in it that I uh, read as a young man. One of the uh, great uh, advantages of being an autodidactic, which is what I am, is that I just learn on my own. I always have. It's been made much easier uh, now that we have the internet, but it's more dangerous. Uh, as a young man, we had a library card, and invariably, if my wife didn't bring me home books she thought I liked, I went and I read books on my own, and I sought out that which I was interested in. Hence, I was not indoctrinated into worldly philosophy. Rather, Rather, I sought out things that I might be interested in, and this is one of the essays that I, uh, I read many years ago before the Internet. This is titled, The Superior, Superior Virtue of the Oppressed. The Superior Virtue of the Oppressed. I present it to you today 
not just as something that contains some truth. Rather, I present it to you today in context of today's verse, that there has never been a time in my lifetime, and dare I say, in antiquity, where truth has been more questioned. Where truth and reality, as we have known it, has become more malleable by the propagandist, by technology, and by minds, our minds being so open and pliable because we have been lulled to sleep by so many sitcoms, so much indoctrination, and so much pharmakia. Bertrand Russell uh, titles this the superior virtue of the oppressed because what he was doing is rebutting the worldly philosophies that had come to say, in essence, I'm okay, you're okay. In fact, there's some people more okay than others. One of the persistent delusions that this humanist writes about uh, here in The Superior Virtue of the Repress, in his first line it says, one of the persistent delusions of mankind is that some sections of the human race are morally better or worse than others. This belief has many different forms, none of which have any rational basis. This is a humanist speaking. This is one who has denied Christ. And yet, he expounds upon the simple fact that there are none good, no, not one. A rather curious form of admiration uh, for groups to which the admirer does not belong, does not belong, is the belief in the superior virtue of the oppressed, such as subject nations, the poor, women, and children. Let me read that again. A rather curious form of admiration for groups that uh, for groups to which the admirer does not belong is the belief in the superior virtue of the oppressed. Anybody that has had a hard time must be a sweetheart. Anybody who has had a struggle in life must, must be morally superior to, say, the rich. Uh, we're getting ready to go in, well, getting ready. We are in this election season, and invariably the rich will be stigmatized as evil, and the poor, the poor trotted as virtuous. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, some people might cite the uh, story that Jesus told about Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man being in a far-off place, akin to hell, definitely separate from God. And then the poor man, Lazarus, in Abraham's bo bosom, close to God, they would point to that and say, see, even Jesus said it is almost impossible for a rich man to go to heaven. Therefore, and they will conclude that the rich must be evil and they must have gotten their gains. They must have gotten their gains by oppressing others. Can I tell you that that is the modern equivalent to Gnosticism? The modern equivalent and even application of Marxist, Leninist thought? And yet, where are we today? Where are most Christians today? Where are most churches today? No, rather than evangelizing the world, they pick low-hanging fruit. Uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump needs Jesus Christ just as anybody else needs him. Amen or oh me. And, and that goes for every billionaire, every millionaire, every dollinaire. Everyone needs Jesus. Do you know how I know? Because the Bible explains it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. And then Jesus further expounded on it by saying, no man comes unto the Father except by me. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Take it up with Jesus. Now, there invariably, there'll be those that say, well, every guru says that. Yeah? Well, every guru didn't raise from the grave. 
Every guru didn't claim that he alone had the power to forgive sins. Now, Bertrand Russell, being a humanist, as all humanists, think that if we can just qualify sin in bad behavior, certainly we can augment behavior. Yes, this is true, and yet you will still die in your sins. Uh, most humanists believe if they can make sinful behavior legal and socially acceptable, people will then become inherently good because that's their nature. And nothing could be further from biblical truth. And Bertrand Russell says, to think anything different is irrational. It's irrational. Let me read some other things here. So these would, uh, they would uh, lift up uh, oppressed nations, the poor, women, and children. Even uh, as the myth of the noble uh, savage came and went, simple annals of the poor came and went, he was fighting this in the 20th century. Liberals, however, still contend to idealize the rural pow, uh, poor, while intellectual socialists and communists did the same for the urban proletariat. Big words. The urban proletariat. And then what? Stalin and Mao Zedong? They murdered them by the tens of millions. A fashion to which, since it only became important to the 20th century, he goes on to say, one by one, these nations that rose to independence from their subjugator, from their oppressor, one by one, these nations rose to independence and were found to be what? Bertrand Russell, the humanist? One by one, were found to be just like everybody else. But the experience of those already liberated did not destroy the illusions that regard to them and their struggle. It, it came as no surprise to Bertrand Russell that once a colony was liberated, they were just as evil and as oppressive as those who had colonized the nation to begin with. I think of India, for example. India, the home, the seat of mystical and mystic thought and self-reflection. And yet, the caste system still exists there. There are people in India that are literally called the untouchables because they believe them to be so filthy and morally defunct that they are not even allowed to be touched. Uh, the English old ladies uh, still sentiment sentimentalized the wisdom of the East and American intellectuals intellectualized about earth concession of the oppressed. These are thoughts that I wanted to share with you today because I believe that as we go further into the 21st, uh, 21st century, we're going to see biblical truth not just challenged, but intellectually, intellectually dismissed. Many socialists and communist intellectuals consider it in vogue to pretend to find the proletariat, the poor, more amiable than other people, while professing a desire to abolish condi the conditions which, according to them, alone produce good human beings. And what happens? We take the poor person who has not Christ, and you put them in charge, and guess what? They're just as evil and wicked as the rich man that was in charge. Why? Well, because we have believed lies. We have, in the United States in particular, and I do believe that this great malaise has gone about throughout the entire world. We have what I wrote about in the devotional last week, generational amnesia. See, I grew up watching things like Dr. Shivago. You remember Dr. Shivago? Yes. I mean, don't get me wrong. He was an adulterous uh, uh, fornicator, the character was. Ah, but still the same. What did we see? We saw in dramatic form how human beings, once being claimed to have been oppressed and degraded, oppress 
and degradate human beings. Well, we have a generation, a de- generational amnesia that has occurred. We have forgotten. Uh, we have forgotten the lessons of the commons. Now, many of you probably don't even know that. Once again, may may or may not speak to the uh, the socialist and communist agenda that has infiltrated our houses of higher learning. But the lessons of the commons went something akin to this. When those who came to this country uh, decided that they would have a more fair, equal, and balanced governance amongst themselves, they went away from what necessarily the Bible would teach in whole and held everything in common. And what was found is, is that when people, say, had cattle... Uh, the, they would let their cattle roam the country, destroy the country, and there would be no, no more feed for the other people's cattle. So quickly they learned to hold things in common meant there was no one who would take responsibility. So what did they do? They parceled up the land. And as they parceled up the land, they allowed those people to quote-unquote own the land and take responsibility for for it, and lo and behold, big shocker here, Andrew, hold on to your britches, lo and behold, the community thrived. The community thrived. No longer propping up the poor, those who did not work, and still allow them to eat, but rather, those who took responsibility and worked, then they were to take part in the fruits of their labor. As I said Wednesday night, invariably there are those who cannot work. This is a different situation. We are talking, if all things being equal, every man, every woman, as they work, they eat. Amen or oh me. No, today what I would do is say this to Bertrand Russell and uh, retort his um, essay, why he was not a Christian, in this. You may have your reasons for not being a Christian, which are all subjective. I have my reasons for being a Christian. And many of those reasons come from this work of yours, this essay, The Superior Virtue of the Oppressed, which he concludes does not exist. But see, I will not stand on Bertrand Russell's authority. Rather, we stand on Bible authority. Amen? Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 3, and we will see what your Bible says. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, a famous verse for our evangelists, a famous verse for the born again, as they realize and have recognized that they are in need of forgiveness. Indeed, once we have been forgiven, we are made new. Ooh, praise the Lord for that, Joanne. I like new things. I like new things. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 reads as such, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All except who? All except Jesus. But we've already established, Don, have we not, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh? Yes, we have. So when Paul puts pen to paper, guided and inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he writes this to the Romans, the Christians at Rome, he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't revel in that, but I do take comfort in this. Christianity, Christianity is the only thing proposed on earth that puts every man and woman, boy and girl, spiritually on the same playing field. Now, we all have different physical traits, and we all have different skills and abilities. Ah, but see, when it comes to being a child of God, there's only one way for anyone to get there, and that is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You can't get around it. You can try and go over it to a futile, uh, to futility. You can't, go, you can't go underneath it. Rather, you must be covered by it. Even as the children of Israel in Egypt covered the doorposts, 
covered the doorpost of their dwellings with the blood of a lamb that was sacrificed, so too must your heart be covered with the blood of the sinless lamb that was sacrificed before the foundations of the world. Those are biblical words. That is biblical truth. When we begin to divert from it, when we begin to legislate these things to try to make our society a better place, having no foundation, they fall apart like a house of cards and they start burning down neighborhoods and stores and fast food joints. Because you know what? They think they can make it better. My friends, I'm not here preaching chaos in a world that's on fire. I'm preaching peace for those who would come out of chaos. I'm preaching biblical truth that you might have the confidence and the peace that surpasses all understanding and knowing that your standing before God is right. Not because of anything you can do. Not because of anything I can do. Not because of anything I can say. Rather, because of our faith in the grace and the love that was shed abroad on that cross 2,000 years ago. We come to the cross. We come to the cross to realize the conviction of our sin, understanding that Jesus need not die. Jesus need not have died. How do I know that? Well, I'm glad you asked, G. Turn with me to poor G. He sits there right on the corner, man. It's like me and you're having a private conversation. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Why? Why is it that we gain our conviction at the cross? Because one who need not have died, one who was innocent, perfect, died on our behalf. How do I know this? Because he didn't earn it. He didn't earn it. Part of admitting that you're in need of forgiveness is understanding that you have earned punishment. It is a punitive, punitive measure that God applies to all of those who would reject his son, Jesus Christ. Does he want to punish people? My friends, if God wanted to punish people, he would just destroy the planet tomorrow. Why even wait till tomorrow? Why doesn't he wipe the planet clean now? It's not, why? Why would God kill anybody? It's, why would God allow any of us to exist? except by his grace and his mercy. God desires that all be saved and come unto the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen or oh me? Amen. Amen. Then tell somebody about him today. Tell somebody about the great love and grace you have been shown. Juxtapose it with your wayward life. And if you are one of those who think you have never sinned, well, I can tell you, you're lying to yourself. You are self-deceived. I don't care if they make it legal. Do you think that I place my faith and trust in the American legal system? Just because it's legal doesn't make it righteous. I would remind you, it was legal to own a human being in this country 200 years ago. It doesn't make it righteous. It doesn't make it moral. And it surely does not make it holy. We look here at Romans 6.23, and it says plainly, the wages of sin is death. We earn our separation. Children, children are born innocent of sin. However, they are born with the same sinful nature. Let me be clear on this. There's somebody who follows us by way of Instagram, and he's very curious about this idea of original sin. You nor I are held accountable for anybody's sin but our own. We are not held accountable for the sin in the garden, but there are relatives. Just like I inherited my father's bald spot, I inherited, I, <laughs> you can laugh, but my father's dead. How do you feel now? No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. <laughs> 
Just like I inherited my pug nose from my mother, I also inherited their sinful nature, who inherited it from their parents, who inherited it from their parents, and on and on back throughout the lineage to the first two. Children are born innocent because they do not know the difference yet. But having come to the understanding of right and wrong, righteousness and sin, understand, they will be held accountable. And my friend, if you're sitting here today, and you, say you just don't like the cut of my jib. You say, I just don't like the way this guy is presenting this today. You know, I don't... I don't, like, I don't like the tone of his voice, and then I really didn't like the songs, and uh, really this guy's breath stinks. That's fine, and yet you will still be held accountable for missing the mark of the perfection that is God. And you will inherit death because you will be paid for that which you have invested in. You have invested in your own intellect, and it is short of the glory of God. You have invested your own understanding, and it falls short of the righteousness of Christ. You have invested in your own ways, and you will be paid in kind. But, but, I love the buts of the Bible. But the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life. Through who? Is that what your Bible says? Then I guess Paul, the amanuensis, the writer, by way of the Holy Spirit of the book of Romans, I guess Paul agrees with Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father except through me. And that God the Father gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall never perish but have eternal life. Do you have that today? Do you have that today? Or are you still applying that college education? You know hell is going to be filled with PhDs. Hell's going to be filled. Hell's going to be filled with master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, high school diplomas. Heaven will be filled with the self-same, except for this. At one time, at one time they came unto the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and they received it. Will you receive it today? Will you see, receive the forgiveness that is freely given to anyone who will accept it? We're going to have a moment of invitation here soon. That's your time to come and publicly profess that you have received forgiveness or that you want to receive forgiveness and then admit, believe on him and confess it before others. You can confess things all you want in your closet and you might get saved. And I say amen to that. But you will never grow. And we aren't just intended to be saved. We are intended to grow as every babe grows to the great joy of their parents, so too we grow to the great joy and pleasure of our God our Father and Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you say, I, I, have, I have been saved, fantastic. Then put on the uniform. The uniform is baptism. It is a declaration. I am no longer my own, I am His. And I am with those who are His. You are baptized showing his death, his burial, his resurrection, and the fact that you believe, you trust, and have faith in, you will die, you will be buried, but you will be risen again. That's baptism. And if you're here today and you don't have a church home to call your own, but you're a born-again baptized believer, I may read a couple things out of Bertrand Russell's excellent essays every now and again but dare I say the lion's share of what is spoken from this pulpit and in these classrooms is this here book because that's all we really have even though clocks may be right twice a day if they're right 
twice a day, all they do is believe in or affirm what has already been established in God's word. Now you know what we're about here. Seeking the kingdom and his righteousness, even as he adds all that we need, including a new roof and clean classrooms. Amen.